JavaScript. JavaScript is the single skill that I think everybody in the 21st century needs to know. And it'll open so many different doors. You can use it for anything. It'll run anywhere. So I created Free Code Camp with the sole focus helping people learn JavaScript. And really that making it that simple and that focused, that proved to be the big difference. And slowly a community formed around the curriculum I'd put together. And gradually we all started coding together and building projects together and people started getting jobs. Nice. So Mr. Larson, I wanted to ask you, um, so you, you said for about three years or so that you had got the job and that you had a, I want, I want to hear about that part too. Like, I want to hear, like, I, I'm, I'm just curious. I'm just wondering like where, like what was your first technology that you learned? Like, uh, the, like take me through those steps right there. If you would, like, how did you get that first job? What motivated you to get that first job and just say, Hey, I'm not, I'm not teaching anymore. I'm still going to be teaching, but I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to take this coding stuff serious. I'm going to take it full time and I'm just going to do that for now. And this is, this is what my new, my new career is going to be and full steam ahead. Like, how did you, how did you make that decision? And how did you like, where, you know, like, I'm just wondering, like, where did that all fit into your plans of like how your life was going to go? Yeah. So a lot of the things I did were kind of a case study in what not to do. First thing I did was I got a, like a netbook, which at the time everybody got netbooks because they were super cheap and it, it was not powerful at all. I just paid like 200 bucks and got this netbook and I only had like two, I updated the RAM and it had like two gigabytes of RAM and I just completely wiped the original version of Windows that was on it and installed like Ubuntu um, and I basically just struggled through like network driver issues and all those kinds of things on my own. But, like I spent probably weeks just getting a stable developer environment. I learned how to do Vim. I learned how to do Emacs. I learned the pro programmer Dvorak keyboard because I thought I could type faster if I did it. So I was spending all this time and energy doing things that weren't actually programming. And I should have just started writing code and, and gotten like a hello world app and started telling people about it and just getting feedback. And, and that's why free code camp, if you look at the way it's designed, it really just throws you right in there. Like, okay, let's build this cat photo app. You know, let's build this uh, tribute page. You're immediately building things. You're getting them live on the internet where other people can give you feedback. You're, you're getting some sort of proof that you have put in some effort. You're not spending a whole lot of time configuring your uh, environment variables. You're not spending time trying to figure out why your Linux instance crashed. You know, uh, in fact, we decided very early on to move everything to the browser so that people wouldn't have to deal with that. Because, I mean, you're still coding when you're on CodePen or on Glitch or on Free Code Camp's uh, developer environment. That's still real coding. It's just that you don't have to deal with all the uh, minutia of getting your dev environment set up right. So uh, I also hopped around a lot once I did start actually programming. I just, whenever a book got really hard, I'd be like, well, what other books do I have? Maybe I can switch to that. The grass is always greener on the other side. And I'd switch programming languages. I started with Python and then I switched to Ruby. Uh, I, have, I did get a job as a Rails developer. That was my first job. And so how did you, how did you go about like uh, trying to get that job? Like, when did you figure, all right, I'm ready. I'm gonna, like, I'm gonna fix up my resume. I'm gonna start going doing that. Well, I just put myself out there. I went to tons of, so basically after a few months of just kind of trial ballooning, whether I could actually be a developer, uh, I said, you know what, I'm gonna go for it. And I put in my notice at my employer and I left you know, a very, very stable job as a school director. Everybody thought I was crazy. Uh, my wife was very supportive, but <laughs> most of the developers that I talked to uh, that I knew were like, well, you're going to drown. It's an ocean that you're going to have to like 
swallow essentially if you want to be a developer there's just too much to learn you got to go get a cs degree um and you're like why stick with what you're good at you know people would say those kinds of things to me and i was just like well you know what i'm gonna try this worst case scenario i have a skill set i can probably go get another school director job somewhere uh, but i just put myself out there i every day 8 a.m sat down at my kitchen table with my laptop out and just forced myself to try to code uh, until 5 p.m. And, you know, now, of course, we've got like Pomodoro technique and all these other things that make it a lot easier to do it. But it was hard. Um, And a lot of the thrashing that I did during the early days really informed the design of Free Code Camp because I don't want anybody to have to go through that process of learning. I got super discouraged. There were several times when I was just throw up my hands and like, basically stopped coding for like a week or two or, or seriously considered like my, my decision and whether I should be a developer. And I don't want people to have to go through that sort of like soul searching unnecessarily because absolutely you can become a developer. You don't even need to quit your job. I didn't need to quit my job. I probably could have just done the nights and weekends thing, but there wasn't really any clear roadmap. There weren't a lot of proof of concepts. You hear about these people working at at Google making a million dollars a year as developers that don't have college degrees, and you're like, well, it's clearly possible, but how, you know? So, uh, yeah, that that was, it was a rough period, but I I knew that I had to put myself out there and that it wasn't just coding skills. A lot of it would be who I knew. A lot of it would be my reputation and what I'd done. So I immediately started going to meetups every single night of the week. I took a a Greyhound up to San Francisco from Santa Barbara and I just crashed on my friend's floor basically and and ate these 7-Eleven pizzas. You could get them for like five bucks and I'd eat half of the pizza for lunch and I'd eat half of the pizza for dinner and I'd just code and then I'd go to a meetup and just frenetically network with as many people as I could and try to you know, meet everybody. I'd, and then every weekend, bam, I was in a hackathon of some sort. I probably did dozens of hackathons and I started winning them eventually. Nice. And I started meeting people who could, you know, give me a job and all that stuff. And, and I basically just put myself in the position that it was like such a wealth of resources and of network and all these things. I was just flooded in opportunity so that something would eventually work out. It was like the ultimate redundancy uh, approach, uh, is total brute force. Um, but yeah, it, there were a lot of dark days there where I was really questioning whether I could do it. Um, and all of that was worth it because now I know precisely the kind of hell people can go through when they're trying to make a serious career change. And I could be, for, be there for them. and. I can kind of like say, Hey, these are the phenomenon you're going to experience. This is totally normal. Uh, Don't worry about it. Like power through it. Knowledge is power. And the reason that human beings can talk to one another and that we have written language and all that is that we can communicate our mistakes to one another and that we can pass things down so that you can learn from other people's mistakes and you don't have to just make the same mistake yourself uh, that everybody else has made. And that's precisely what I did. Like I went through the proverbial grinders uh, so that I could come out on the other side and kind of tell people what traps to avoid and things like that. Um, And, you know, tons of other people went through that exact same process. There are probably hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of self-taught developers who went through that same trial and error process. Uh, And some of them did document it, but I just wanted to kind of create a central community where those you know insights could be shared and and pain could be spared serious so after you got that first job like what happened after that like so you you uh i don't want to say the company but you say you got a rails job after that after you got that rails job and you were going through the hackathons and you just hammering out code started winning hackathons see i i got a buddy named bart that i did my first podcast with he actually uh he's like six now he was like 17 when I met him from the Boca Free Code Camp uh, uh, meetup, and uh, I met him, like uh, he uh, he's like 17 when I met him. He's 18 now, and 
he's uh doing like virtual reality uh and ar and vr and mr and and a bunch of other type of reality stuff just building games on phones and making it like come to life and stuff it's really super cool so i'm wondering like uh, after you you uh he, he got his first shot from a hackathon too is why i mentioned him uh after you you started going to hackathons you got the ruby job now after that what happened like what happened after that like so you got the job and then i remember i remember i remember on your uh on your older instagram not the free code camp but on your personal instagram from way back when that i saw a video and i had to repost it on my instagram and just say like yo this man started free code camp in his closet dude like and then I remember reading about, um, I remember re reading before that, probably that same day, I had just read another article about how you said that you were like going to coffee shops and stuff and paying overpriced coffee to go and code in the coffee shop or whatever. And then you met some dude that looked like the creator of, um, I don't know if it was like PHP or some, some, some like Linux thing or something, the creator, some big dude, like gruffy beard. You said that you saw him out in, uh, I think it was uh, some coffee shop or something and you, you you met him and he was like, dude, I, I stay home. Like I haven't left my home in a month. And after I heard that, I was like, oh, that sounds like me. <laughs> yeah. So once I got the job, uh, I mean, imposter syndrome set in pretty hard. I was 30 something and surrounded by a bunch of, you know, 20 somethings who all had CS degrees. Um, and it was very much a, a uh, humbling process where, you know, I was used to being in a position of authority and having a team of like 25 people who were basically looking to me for guidance uh, to know what to do and everything like that. And suddenly I was basically the worst person in the band, so to speak. And that's always a good position to be in counterintuitively because you can only stand to learn and to benefit. And if you have the grit to stick with it and to persevere through uh people's you know innocent comments uh that you perceive as like slights or judgments on your behavior or something like that i mean they're not thinking like uh, they don't realize how brittle your ego is when you're just learning to code and um you know when they're like well actually or when they're like oh what the heck is this you know they're not trying to hurt your feelings. That's just how they interact with one another. And they don't necessarily know any better because they all went through the exact same process of going to like an elite university and learning the exact same thing. And, and they've been kind of, the, if you look at it as like a process of selection, uh, people have been weeded out from the developer process. That's how traditional universities work. They have like weeder courses they're supposed to separate the really motivated people from the less motivated people uh, who are going to either drop out of college or go into like a quote unquote easier major or something like that. So um, they're just used to being around people who have very similar backgrounds as them. And so, you know, it can, it can be hard. And, and I say this is, you know, a white male um, who, who is a native English speaker and who grew up middle class and all this stuff. Like I've got all these privileges going for me. And even I felt extreme imposter syndrome going in there. So I can only imagine what it feels like for a lot of people. Uh, but yeah, it, you have to persist through that. And that was what the process was like, was me just being wrong over and over and over and feeling really stupid all the time and just gradually powering through that. And I, I think for a lot of people, First of all, I think a lot of uh, organizations have started to realize that imposter syndrome is real and that it affects a lot of people and have started, maybe a lot of teams have had non-traditional technology learners on their team. And so they're, they're more attuned. Uh, but at the time, it was just a, a really rough experience, but it was totally worth it. And I'm totally glad that I persisted and that I didn't get discouraged because at any time, I guess I could have gone back to working as a school director. And to some extent that was a handicap because at the end of a really rough day, when I would just been spending an entire day trying to battle some sort of like, Oh, all my C libraries got screwed up or like, I just totally screwed up my, my Git uh, tree 
And now I have no idea how I'm going to like get out of this weird detached head state. And I've been here for like an hour and uh, you know, they're paying me a bunch of money and all my peers are like sailing on getting knocking out cards on, on the uh, Jira board and all that stuff. Like you get, you get these really lows and, and you start to look at like, Oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm not a total idiot because I've done this, this, and this. And you start to, you know, try to almost talk yourself out of being a developer. And so that was a really uh, rough process, but I don't think that that was unique to me. I think that's very typical of what people go through. And, uh, you know, life is a struggle. You know, we live in these nice protected environments. We don't have like wild animals trying to kill us. We don't have to bury water you know, in the dirt in case there's, uh, you know, a drought or we go for a long time between oases and we need to have water to survive. We don't have to deal with like insane pestilences generally. Uh, we, we live in the 21st century. We have all these amenities. And I think that as a result, uh, we kind of forget that life is a struggle and that, that the universe is an extremely harsh place and that people aren't intending to turn things that way but that's just the nature of reality and that we need to be tough definitely no that's the truth all right so so after you left that job what did you start doing like so when did so from the time that you got that job it, you said you were there for about three years so how long why did you leave there and then between between that time when did you start building free code camp so I was there for a year and I was just obsessed with the notion of helping other people learn to code. And I learned a ton and I could have kept working there. I was, I was getting better at my job and uh, becoming closer with my teammates. But I just, I knew that um, if I'd stayed there, then I'd probably become a little bit more, um, comfortable in my ways and I may not ever go out and create a tool. And I still had this fresh learner's perspective. I, w I was a, um, I was new to coding and I still could empathize with what it's like to learn to code. You know, you talk to these people who've been developing since they were kids and they're like, Oh, learning to code's easy. Uh, I don't know what, why it's so difficult for you or people who think that it's innate that, that somehow people are born coders or something like that. And the reality is they just have forgotten the struggles that they went through early on, or they were too young to remember. I mean, if you're like some really lucky kid like Mark Zuckerberg and you just have really rich parents and they hire a programming tutor for you through high school and you just grow up having people encouraging you to do all these things, then of course you're going to, um, you're going to be on kind of a golden path and it'll seem like it's really easy and you'll forget about all the error messages and you'll forget about all those things. But um, for me, I still retain that, that uh, beginner's mindset. And while that was still there, I wanted to turn around and document as much of that as possible and design a system that could help people power through all those difficulties and make it easier to learn to code. So that's why I left and I built several different tools to try to help people learn to code uh, just on my own. Uh, and, and sometimes with some friends around San Francisco, none of those got any wide adoption. Uh, and I was, you know, my wife was extremely patient, but I had some job offers and all that stuff. And I was really tempted to just go and work as a developer some more and give up on my dream of trying to help people learn to code. Um, and that's when the free code camp break happened. I sat down and over the course of three days after I had that flash of insight, I just need to teach JavaScript. If I can just teach JavaScript and if I can just have this really simple thing that helps people learn JavaScript, then that'll be a good enough foothold to help a lot of people. Once I had that, then, uh, you know, that's when the, the wind start, started to change. Hmm. Okay. So you said one day, about a year into it, you just sat down for three days and just was like, I got, you want, that's that teacher instinct right there first, but that's, that's awesome. Um, that you just wanted to teach JavaScript and stuff like that. That's, that's beautiful, man. Uh, so yeah. So like what, all right. I don't think, I, I don't think I've, I've ever seen this anywhere. What were like the first steps 
that you just started making into uh, putting down into like, all right, this is going to be, so obviously you and your friends, you guys were making these other things in uh, San Francisco, like these learning kind of things uh, that you said nobody really used. But now you had all this knowledge of what not to do. Now you put it together into something that actually is like pr pretty much like the, the, the genesis of perfection. Uh, so what, what were like the first steps of like you making the free code camp platform? And like, I remember that you said that you were going to the, um, the, the coffee shops and that you just sat, you, you decided to just sit down in your closet and do it, uh, and just knock it out. Like what, what were the first steps for all this? Yeah. So I learned pretty early on just reading software engineering theory, reading lots of books, reading lots of influential blogs. Uh, that you really do want to stand on the shoulders of giants. You don't want to reinvent the wheel. You don't want to try to build everything from scratch. I certainly learned this from some of my previous projects where we had tried to build simple things that we never should have bothered trying to build ourselves from scratch. So first thing I did was I decided I wanted to use at, at the time, like the most contemporary tools, everybody in San Francisco was switching from Django and from Rails to this new tool called Node.js that was incredibly fast and uh, allowed you to just code in the same language, both on the server and, and the client. And so I was like, great, like, I guess I'll learn that. And there was this awesome project on GitHub called Hackathon Starter, and it was designed just for building hackathon projects, but it, had authentication it had basic database uh integrations through mongoose with mongodb so it used uh kind of like the mern stack or the the mean stack uh mongodb and angular or um react and then express and and node and i was like cool well this is what we want to teach anyway because this is where all the jobs are so we should eat our own dog food and use this as our stack. And so I used the hackathon starter and I just started updating it to give it the basic functionality that we needed to track people being able to complete challenges and uh, people could log in and have kind of a public profile that would show which challenges they've completed. M most of the original, most of the current functionality of freecodecamp.org was there pretty early on. And then, uh, he, then when I wasn't utterly embarrassed with the code, I, I open sourced it before it was on like Bitbucket in a private repo. And I was like, no, we need to make this open source. So I went through and just cleared the entire Git repository of any possible keys I'd hard coded and everything like that. And I pushed it live to GitHub and uh, people started contributing to it. And uh, the curriculum, like some of the early contributions that were really consequential uh, were people creating interactive coding challenges before it basically just been a list of links where you self-reported like, okay, I've completed Harvard CS50 uh, or I've completed Stanford's uh, Intro to Computer Science JavaScript section. Uh, it was just this list of different sections, right? And, and as soon as you finished, you clicked okay. And we were originally using... Uh, a chat room system and then we launched a forum and the forum of course has grown and forums I think are more conducive to large communities where people help one another because instead of answering the same question over and over people just google things and they find your forum post that you've already spent a lot of time answering somebody's question and uh, it just makes it easy to have nice threaded discussions that are easily searchable so the forum cropped up and then somebody was like well hey we want to have Facebook or we want to have like local study groups where we had these coffee and codes. And I was like, well, great. Facebook has groups and everybody's already on Facebook. Let's all jump on there and, and create Facebook groups for the different cities and we'll have a directory of them. So that happened and we started creating uh, video tutorials and putting them up on YouTube. And uh, I had been writing a lot of blog posts and we'd just been using blogger, but medium was this new platform at the time. So we jumped on Medium and we started publishing on there as well. And a lot of other people were like, hey, can I publish in your Medium publication so your audience can see this as well? And so we did that. And now I think we have the biggest Medium publication on Medium. And 
we have a lot of articles that are published every day and the YouTube channel is growing. And so it's not just a curriculum anymore. It's a, a very vibrant in-person community of study groups who get together and code together. And then there's the, the YouTube channel, which is I think the fastest growing programming. It, it's the largest active programming channel. The new Boston technically has more subscribers, but it has been inactive for like three years. The, the guy who was running it just, I guess, burned out and disappeared. Um, nobody knows what happened to him. He's a cool guy. He's, he makes chess videos now. Um, but uh, so all of these things happen. And then we launched the Freako Camp podcast, of course, which uh, every Monday we publish a new interview with a different developer, many of whom are from the community uh, and went through Freako Camp and are now working at different uh, companies or have created different projects. So yeah, it all, it all sort of organically unfolded. We got 501c3 nonprofit status uh, a couple of years ago, and that was something that took a long time to get, but we always knew from the beginning, we're going to be a nonprofit, we're going to be open source, and we're going to just try to do everything we can to help as many people as possible. That's our goal. We're, you know, we just want to help people at scale. We want to help billions of people learn to code. That it is, it'll take decades to do that, but we're in it for the long haul. That's it. That's it. That's exactly what it is. You know, and, and that's why we appreciate you so much. A lot of people, they would have taken this and just tried to like, tried to like just maximize the profit. Like as soon as, you know, they hit a million users, as soon as their YouTube channel blew up or this or that, like you guys have stayed true to the, to the foundation of what you guys, you know, do since, since the beginning. And that's, you know, that's why we, we salute you for everything. Um, we have a question in the chat. Uh, uh, it says, um, ask about being in Silicon Valley and what that allowed him in, him to be exposed to and what he thinks that added um, to. So, so you being in, in Silicon Valley, what did, that, uh, what did that allow you to be exposed to? And uh, how, how did you, how did that add to your, uh, to your beginnings, to, you know? Silicon Valley is still the Mecca for technology. And there's just an incredible amount of talent, an incredible amount of ideas and a lot of resources. You know, most of the major venture capital firms are based in Silicon Valley. And as a result, uh, you know, when you have tons of money, going into things, you're able to hire really talented developers. A lot of the best developers in the world don't even care that much about money. And uh, so you're not necessarily going to get all the most talented developers just based on that alone. Uh, a lot of it is idealism. They really want to do things, you know, like if you look at like Mozilla, you look at Wikipedia, uh, Khan Academy, a lot, a lot of these programs have amazing talent that, you know, you just couldn't buy. You have to find people who are inspired to do it. But there's a reason why so many big tech companies are based in Silicon Valley. And it's because there's just this rich ecosystem and you can replicate that ecosystem in other places. It's just hard. Uh, you have to have the critical mass of investment and of a, uh, usually a really good research university. I mean, Boston, for example, has MIT. Uh, India has a lot of great uh, ITT schools, IIT, uh, Indian Institute of Technology. Uh, they've got an incredible chain of, of great universities. California has the University of California University System. And, you know, of course, Berkeley, uh, even Cal Poly and uh, schools like that out there. Uh, and you, you've got great research universities everywhere. Uh, University of Texas, University of Oklahoma, uh, University of Michigan, just to name a few. But having a, a powerful university that has a lot of people going through there doing a lot of research that they can commercialize is definitely a big plus. But me being in Silicon Valley just meant that I, you go to a coffee shop, everybody's got their laptops up, they're working on a project. Things move quickly. People have ideas. People test their ideas. Their ideas fail. They move on to other things. Of course, Silicon Valley also attracts a lot of people, uh, you know, th that aren't necessarily in it for building something of consequence, but are just interested in making money. And, you know, software engineering d 
wages are now as high as you know financial advisor wages and, and they're quickly approaching uh, you can make almost as much money as a software engineer as you can make it on Wall Street in a lot of cases. Uh, certainly if you're founding a company and if you look at all the biggest companies in the world right now, unless you you know, count Aramco and some partially state-owned uh, companies, the, the biggest corporations are all founded by software engineers. So um, they're there's that ecosystem and a lot of people go there just because they think that it's going to maximize their likelihood of success. Now that's why I went there. I wanted to be in the Mecca. I wanted to learn as quickly as possible. The reality is not everybody can get a visa to go to the U S not everybody can afford to live in the most expensive Metro area in the United States, which is San Francisco at this point. I mean, it's even more expensive than New York. And uh, so do you need to go there? No, absolutely not. But if you have the resources to go there, even for a little while, I would recommend it. I think that it's a, it's, it was a great experience. And I lived in San Francisco for like three or four years. And I don't regret living there, even though it cost a ton of money. And I was in a shoebox of an apartment, my wife and my kid. And, uh, but I learned an incredible amount. And everywhere I went, there were just these brilliant people. Now, I'm optimistic that we can create other Silicon Valleys all over the world. And I think it's it's kind of a fallacy that, that we look to Silicon Valley for the future. Because, I mean, a lot of the big, most innovative technology companies are based in Seattle now. Or Boston, as I said. Uh, a lot of them are, are in the UAE. You know, uh, people are creating great ideas everywhere. And it's not like the bits travel slower if you're in Mexico City. Uh, you know, you are a few hundred extra milliseconds away on the internet so uh you know i think lagos could be a major technology capital in the near, f- near future shenzhen uh and, and shanghai and beijing in china are certainly emerging as uh technology centers uh india already has several of them so i'm optimistic that silicon valley will be a, a declining share of the total amount of like great engineers coming out and great companies coming out. It's still going to be a force we reckon with for some time to come. And I still recommend going there if you can. All right. Man. Such great answers, man. <laughs> it's like, it, it really just resonates. You got to take it all in, man. You got to, uh, excuse the dogs, but yeah, I'm serious. Um, hey man, we just got Pat in here. Pat is another one of our study group members. Uh, I know we did the intros earlier, but dude is kicking butt, man. Um, uh, he went through free code camp um, and just knocked it out of the park. Uh, but uh, so, yeah. So, oh. Uh, Adam also yeah. joined us. Uh, he may yeah, not have much time. Adam and Pat, dude. Adam, Pat, DK, these are my JavaScript gurus right here. Yeah. They, seriously, they're the ones that went through free code camp and just. They, they went through it together as a team, and that's what I'm talking about. That's that's what I wanted. Like, they did what they were supposed to do. And yeah. Adam now, he, he's gotten a job. Uh, Pat, he's getting a job. DK, he's getting a job. He's actually – I think DK's moving to, uh, like, Canada or something. He's, he's moving somewhere soon, but – you're mute, DK. You're muted. Uh, you have to unmute. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm working on moving soon. Like I'm, I'm immigrating to um, Ireland soon. So because I'm, I'm, I'm going there for my masters. So that's I'm just going to like, get the opportunity to like actually um, get the exposure and get jobs like better jobs and all. So everything is just I'm just making an effort to get a better life. That's what I'm talking about. Um. So let me ask you this. As for uh, as for when you decided to take the community from Bitbucket to GitHub, how like what was your team like already? How was how was the Bitbucket team already, and how was how did you get it like set up to where it's like I'm sure this was like your first time, like just man, I'm not sure. I'm not I'm not sure if this was your first time managing such a big community like 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 you have now, like. When you when you when you made that that transition from Bitbucket to GitHub, what was that like? Like, how did you how how did you progress and how did you just just get into that that you know that that where you're just managing it, that project managerial position right there? Like, how, what was that like? 
Well, a lot of it was just, you know, swallowing my pride and acknowledging that I was going to make a lot of mistakes publicly and that I was going to say stupid things and do stupid things that people would be like, well, why did you do that? What were you thinking there? Or that people would be looking, putting my code under a microscope and saying, wow, Quincy Larson thought he would be a better coder than this, you know, things like that. So um, I think that it was more of a psychological challenge than anything. Uh, you know, the reality is you just do uh, get remote <laughs> ad and then the GitHub repo and you do get push, right? And uh, that that's what happened once we were sure that we wanted to uh, migrate over to GitHub. And uh, of course, once we were there, you know, GitHub has really great roles and permissions and things like that. And people within the community, which was at the time mostly a chat room uh, on Gitter, uh, people started jumping in and uh, they were like, hey, I'll help QA pull requests or, hey, I, I think that this could be worded better. Or have you considered, you know, adding this test for this corner case on this specific challenge? And it was just very incremental. Just uh, people just stepping up and volunteering their time and their their effort. And in many cases, their expertise. But a lot of times people were just as new as I was and still coming forward and, and trying their best. And we couldn't accept all the pull requests, of course, uh, but we just were very polite and supportive of everybody who attempted to help. And we just wanted to make sure that it was clear that we were gonna do everything we could to try to help them get pull requests accepted. And we were gonna be as an inclusive a community as possible and that we really did value every contribution and that everybody was helping make this resource uh better and the fact that it's open source and that it's free and free is right in the name free co camp that's intentional uh you know we don't show ads on youtube we don't do anything uh the only way that we sustain ourselves is through donations and for the first few years we weren't even a 501c3 nonprofit, and i just basically bankrolled it myself just for my savings uh but and that's a luxury most people don't have but i was mid-career uh, and I'd been saving a ton of my, I'd been saving like half of everything I'd earned. My okay. wife and I were like just super fiscally, you know, penny pinching really. I mean, like we'd go to like, if we'd order Chinese food and, and we'd like make our own rice to the rice cooker to save a buck or two. Right. Um, and, and little hacks like that. Uh, and, and we like negotiated everything because you know we spent a ton of time in china and that's how they do it in china and uh we were just socking money away uh for the first few years of our career and then we didn't know what to use that for but we were able to use that to keep frico camp up and running uh for the first few years so um you know because our motives were pure and it was clear that this genie was out of the bottle and there, this wasn't some sort of weird bait and switch where we were going to go, ha, 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 no, really, we're like a megacorp and we're going to sell our, our user data, all this stuff, right? Like, instead, because everything was super clear that this was a commons, people were very happy to step forward and contribute. And I think that played a major role. Serious. And we appreciate you so much for not trying to be the next Facebook and the next Twitter, Reddit, all these other people that sell there, just take advantage of people and just, you know, De demean their privacy and all this all this foolishness we appreciate you so much for for um not for not doing that and just taking taking the coding community to a level that it should have been on that, that it's supposed to be on you know like like you know i don't like I, I don't know how to kind of equate you to tour but like because you're because like i like you're kind of like past that in a way but like you just you take our privacy serious you you know with the whole not i don't i don't get how you don't put ads on facebook when i saw that i mean on youtube when i saw that i was like wow like they're taking free code camp the free part of free code camp to a whole nother level like like everybody puts ads on there when you said you're not putting when i saw that you that i was like wow all right let me uh so we have a question in uh the chat it was uh all right, so I, I think, I think, I think we pretty much have your roadmap, though. I think, uh, yeah. I, oh wait, so when, 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 
when uh, last question though before we get to the questions in the, in the chat and then we'll just everybody can come on and ask questions and just we can all chop it up together last question like when did you when did you really decide hey i'm taking free code camp to the next level and i'm taking this full time and i'm quitting this so like you quit the teacher job already now you, like when did you quit that software uh engineer job and just just take just decide like this is like t take free code camp and make that the next transition into being your career like when did this really be when, when did that happen how did that happen well the vikings whenever they invaded a new country uh or i guess this was before the nation state era right whenever they decided that they wanted to sail their boats to a new territory and they were going to conquer that territory whenever they got there on the beaches they'd turn around They'd light torches and they'd torch their ships. Burn and them. their ships would burn to smolders and they'd be stranded out in that new land and they would have no choice but to go out and conquer it. And when I quit my job as a school director, to some extent I was burning my boat at the shore. And I was saying, look, like I'm going to go and I'm going to conquer this new area. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a new life for myself in, in software development and and then when i left my software developer job and i started building learning resources i was like i'm gonna i'm gonna make a new life for myself in this new land this this uh new world of uh of technology education resources and so i had already made the decision and i committed to it psychologically and i think that was really important and uh I could have just as easily been stranded out there. I could have, you know, it could have been Easter Island. All the trees could have been chopped down and I could have burned my boats and then realized, oh, there's no trees. I can't build another boat. I can't go anywhere. This land is barren. I'm, I'm doomed. Uh, you never know. Uh, but, you know, luck plays a huge, huge role in everything we do. And anybody who thinks that they're like self-made and that like luck didn't play a big part in how they got to where they are, you know, there are roads you drive on hundreds of years ago in the United States, a bunch of uh, men in sweaty wigs sat down in uh, you know, a, a big building and, and came up with like a framework that a country operates on and, and then started levying taxes and providing public education. And no man is an island and we're all very much uh, beneficiaries of people who've come before us who've kind of laid the foundations. So uh, I ascribe a lot of my success to the foundations that I stand upon, the shoulders that I've climbed upon. Uh, I ascribe a lot of my success to just dumb luck. I mean, probably anybody could have sat down if they were sufficiently motivated and did what I did. I don't think I have some like predestined, you know, talent or ability that millions of other people don't have. I just got lucky and was in the right place at the right time. And, seeing that I was in the right place in the right time, I doubled down and I, I kept working on it. So yeah, I, I think that, um, I don't think that's unique to me. There's nothing special about me. I'm lucky and I try to be humble about that luck. And I try to help other people realize that they are lucky too and that their circumstances are going to help them out and to just be grateful. Serious. All right, um, so we have a few questions in the uh, chat, and I think, uh, I mean, it, Mr. Larson, is, is there, do you think there's anything, like, in your roadmap that I kind of missed? Like, uh, like, I know we're on version 7.0 of Free Code Camp. Would you, would you, uh, would you like to elaborate more on that? I, I know you're freaking super proud on that, man. Like, that, I can't even imagine what being on a, a different, like, like, you know, just, just taking my baby from here to there like that, man. It's super cool. Like, uh, I don't know. Maybe like a gist on that or so. But besides that, we have uh, some questions in the uh, in the chat. Elliot, if you want, when uh, uh, I think we're pretty much done with the uh, roadmap, though. Like, when you, if he gets time to uh, to just answer, um, I, I think he's kind of elaborated already. Like we're just kicking butt and chewing. Like we're just kicking butt and taking names with this free code camp thing on how, how he's taking it forward and the community's taking it forward and just 
like you said, just incremental steps, and that's what it really is, man. Like, yeah. Seriously. Yeah. But what, Elliot? Ask I me think, questions man, from my, from where it's like. Huge sure, and, and can I just have like one minute? Yeah, sure. It sure. will be right, right back, and okay, you can fine. edit this part out. But uh, let me let me pause the recording. You guys have. We're just gonna chop it up with Mr. Larson, man. Get your guys' questions out there. You know, let him know like what you guys have been like. You know, like craving to ask him, man. You know, now, now is the time. Of, you know, like. Right now is the time that uh you guys can go and ask your questions. Any questions you guys have, you know, any recommendations, any uh, ideas, you know, just uh you know, be yourselves. Talk if you, as if you were talking to me or you know if you're talking to anybody, man. Just let's uh don't be shy. Let's uh let's let's, let's introduce yourselves. We've already introduced ourselves, so now is the time to whatever's on our minds, just get it off and uh you know express. So I know you guys have had some. Uh, written uh, questions in the chat. So, uh, Elliot and uh, DK, I think both of you guys have uh, questions that you guys have put in the chat. Uh, DK can ask his first. Okay. If he's ready. You're muted, DK, by the way. Sorry, I forgot. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm so overwhelmed right now, bro. Okay, let me... Um... <laughs> okay, um... Uh, again, Quincy, thanks for your, thank you for the opportunity to um, for this, and I'm really I'm really grateful for this. So, uh, my question is: um, <clears throat> Do you recommend learning multiple technologies at the same time? If so, how do you recommend dealing with the overwhelming feeling that comes with it? I recommend learning one primary language and one stack at a time, and uh, I wrote an article actually if you google what programming language should i learn first my article comes up first and <laughs> okay. of course it, it recommends javascript i'm a big cheerleader for javascript as kind of the lingua franca of the web and also as a really good high level scripting language that's under heavy development you know microsoft is contributing an incredible amount to it google facebook all these major corporations and uh all these Developers and NGOs, you know, Node Foundation, all, uh, Mozilla, everybody's trying to make JavaScript as good as possible. So it's a very powerful language. It runs right in the browser. If you learn it first, you can use it for pretty much anything. So I would just recommend learning that for unless you are totally dead set on learning Python, which frankly is the only other language I would consider learning first as a first language would be Python. Uh, unless you're a kid, if you're a kid, you can learn Scratch first. Um, and, and there are some other languages that are really good for kids to learn like Lua uh, so you can do some basic game development with that but uh, I recommend just learning one thing once you've learned one language really comprehensively it's easy to go and learn another one uh, most programming languages are very similar they're all applying the same principles and data structures that were pioneered in the 60s and 70s uh, there's really nothing that new under the sun um, you know you could argue that like you know, blockchain and, and serverless architecture and things like that are genuinely new and novel ideas. Uh, but even those are based off of like underlying fundamentals. So master the fundamentals and you'll be set to learn the more complicated stuff later. And the best way to master those fundamentals is to just stick with a single set of tools and not try to, you know, go and like learn everything in multiple different languages because then it'll just take you a lot longer to cover all the basics. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you, for, thank you for the detailed answer. Thank you. Yeah, did that answer your question? Yes, yes, it did. It did. Okay. Uh, I think I was, uh, okay. I think Pat okay, uh, had a few questions. Uh, Pat, do you want to do your questions? Yeah, sure, I'll go. Um, okay, go ahead. So my first question, Quincy, is uh, how do you find the best way to deal with hitting a learning plateau or just hitting burnout when you're going so hard coding? Hey, man. Quincy, did you get that? Yeah. Okay. So you're going to hit plateaus and um, – Sorry, if everybody who's not talking can mute, I can still hear a little bit of environmental noise.
sorry. Uh, you're going to hit plateaus. Uh, a lot of the plateaus aren't actually plateaus. They just feel like plateaus. Every day that you're sitting down and you're coding and you're building, you are getting better. It's just a question of that perceived progress. And um, some days are going to feel like off days, but you, you, every day you're sitting down and you're coding, you are making progress, whether it's perceptible or not. So the important thing to know is just that it's a marathon, not a sprint. And you aren't going to have earth shattering revelations every single day. You're not going to have coding epiphanies every single coding session. A lot of the progress is going to feel grindy, but it's there. Um, instead of constantly trying to change things up, uh, just make little incremental tweaks. Uh, I would say, for example, in incorporate it one new tool per project. For example, I wouldn't try to say, oh, I'm going to completely switch stacks and, and do all this and learn all this stuff because I, I think you may be overwhelmed and psychologically you may procrastinate sitting down to work on that project if, if it's overly stressful. So you have this comfort zone and there's kind of this pioneering front just beyond the perimeter of that comfort zone. And that's where you want to be. That's the Goldilocks zone for learning is just beyond your current capabilities. So don't bite off more than you can chew, but at the same time, do try to bite off a substantial enough chunk. And it, it's just like a, it's a balancing act really. Uh, Cause you should never be totally comfortable. You should always be slightly uncomfortable, slightly off balance, slightly having to work a little bit harder than you want to. Um, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, that yeah. is helpful. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, my second question is, where do you see people that tend to lean more generalist in the tech industry? I know, you know, pretty much everything is specialized nowadays. You know, every, everything's a specialist, you know, from business all the way down to, you know, to the medical field. Everything is specialization. Where do you find people that consider themselves generalist? Uh, where do you find a place for them in the tech industry? So this is, I think, one of the most common misconceptions that people have about the nature of reality uh, and career trajectories in general. Everybody should start out as a generalist. That's how it's always historically been. If you look uh, up until a few hundred years ago, everybody studied the exact same liberal arts curriculum, right? Um, if you go to MIT, everybody takes the exact same six core generalist courses. And MIT still retains a lot of that. I mean, the best engineering school in the world, arguably, still retains that generalist mindset that everybody should be a generalist. And so you are a generalist in school, and then you specialize on the job. That's how it works. Somebody's paying you. Uh, you're a developer. And they're like, okay, hey, we need to do this, this, and this. And you gradually just get assigned things and your career just gradually kind of tugs in a specific direction. Look at medical school. It's the same way. Everybody goes to the same four years of medical school. Then they specialize through a residency program, law profession. Everybody learns the same basic law for like three, four years. I think most law programs are in the U.S. for three years. And then they specialize depend on, depending on where they go and get their first job. Uh, and, and I believe that's how things should be. And I think it's a huge mistake for universities to be offering these like very micro, you know, nuanced majors. Because, I mean, how many people do you know who get like a really specific major that actually end up working in that major, right? Like instead of going to film school, you should be going to liberal arts school. Then you'll learn how to write. You'll learn you know, how to communicate. <laughs> you'll learn a whole lot of other skills. You'll learn a bunch of history, uh, language, things like that, that will help you create films uh, with, with technology instead of becoming like, I'm going to be, you know, an information, uh, you know, an MIS degree, or I can't remember what the, uh, what the, the degree that was really popular around the dot-com bubble was, uh, but CIS maybe. But uh, instead of getting that specialist thing, just get a computer science degree. Uh, or, you know, and so 
ideally universities should only have a few colleges and everybody should learn the same basic things in those colleges. Then they should learn everything else on the job. And employers, of course, should be spending a lot more money on training. Uh, historically, they have. Then in the 80s, there was a regression where companies just spent less and less money on training and relied more and more on people going back and getting master's degrees and PhDs and stuff to fill it in. But it's never really been the role of higher education to teach super specific industry specific stuff. It's really been the role of employers and they just kind of lazily offloaded that because that's how capitalism works. But now corporations are coming around and they're saying, well, we do need to have more training. And you know, there are tons of like coding boot camps that work very closely with employers to provide training. Udacity has like very specific training programs that employers will like pay for their uh, people to do, you know, Pluralsight, Linda, all these other places have like basically paid subscriptions that corporations can get so that they can have continuing professional development. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, that's a very long way to the answer, but don't worry about specialization. Find an employer who values the fact that you have a broad general understanding of the fundamentals and is willing to bring you up and help you specialize within their company. If they're not willing to do that, screw them. Find somebody else. There are tons of jobs out there especially for a developer who understands the fundamentals. Awesome. Thank you. I think uh, Andrew had a question that yeah. uh, piggybacked off that one. Yeah, go ahead, Andrew. If you're, if you're there. You're muted also. I'm going to unmute you. Hey, can you all hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Excellent. Quincy, a couple of questions ago, you gave some great strategies for dealing with learning burnout, how to um, do a bite a day and over time, like you said, running the marathon versus running the sprint, you would get better even if it didn't feel that way. I suppose my question is this, um, by the time a person has done all of the learning modules on something like Free Code Camp or any other service, if they actually mastered all that material in some ways, they would be over prepared to get a job because of just how much material is there. Can you think of when a point is in a person's learning curriculum that they might be at a place where they could start applying for junior developer roles? Would you recommend going all the way through the curriculum in a program? Or do you think based on the projects that you have built, then you might be able to go ahead and start applying even if you're still in the process of your learning? So that was quite a question. That's a great <laughs> question. And, and uh, yes, I think that it's an important question because pretty much everybody here on this call and everybody who's listening at some point is going to have to make that decision. When should I start applying for a job? And everybody's different. Um, everybody's circumstances are different. If you've got like a really stable job and you're already able to provide for your family, it may make sense to just, you know, Take it easy and, and focus on building your skills before you start applying. Uh, but I will tell you that there is no downside to applying to jobs as early as you feel like doing it. It's not like there's some sort of uh, cabal of employers that get together to talk about candidates like, oh, you know, I don't know about this Jonathan guy. He came in and he bombed an interview. You shouldn't even talk to him. No, employers are busy. They don't give a damn. They're like totally distracted with their own things and they just are sorting through these resumes, spending six seconds to look at a resume, right? And trying to pull people in and, and interview them real quick. They just want to find a good fit. They want to minimize the risk. They will interview you. If you don't make it past the phone screen, that's great validation of the fact that you need to, to keep working on your skills. But it's you want a big sample size. You want it to... Uh, apply to a lot of jobs and have a lot of failed phone screens before you're like, hmm, maybe I'm not ready. Maybe I should spend a few more months drilling on these algorithms or, or um, just understanding computer science fundamentals better so I can answer these questions. You know, if you're, if you're failing out at the in-person, you know, the on-site interview, uh, that's additional information. If you're making it to where you get job offers, that's additional information because like, okay, that's validation. These people are willing to hire me I can keep pushing my skills a little bit more. I can keep applying and maybe get an even better job. Uh, so everything you do is just, you're, you're using time. That's the ultimate currency that we're all dealing with. Um, time you spend flying out to Washington to interview at 
Microsoft because they have very generous, you know, they'll like put you in a hotel and let you fly out there. And a lot of big companies will do that if you make it to the onsite interview. And that's, those are days of your life that you can't spend sitting down, like building projects that are going to expand your skills. And, and in many cases, I'd argue that that's worth it. But you just have to ultimately make decisions about how you want to spend your time. Uh, but don't worry, like failure is not fatal. <laughs> you're going to get rejected from a ton of jobs. Uh, there's a great article. If you just Google like coding bootcamp, like I think just Google coding bootcamp, uh, at that term, like a couple, maybe one or two, uh, links down, there'll be this great article by this, uh, uh, UC Berkeley grad who went to one of the best coding boot camps. I think uh, hack reactor or it was either hack reactor or app Academy. One of the really selective ones. And, and just because they're selective doesn't mean they're, they're good, but I can say that like people from these coding boot camps generally have good good results, and and a lot of coding boot camps are really great. Um, but these are kind of like the earlier ones uh, that are more prestigious. Just like Harvard is the most prestigious school because it was the first school in the United States, the first university. Um, so if you look at what he did, he applied to six hundred different jobs. And he has like all these different, like, like he got rejected from hundreds of jobs, right? But eventually he got like seven different offers. Uh, so it's just a, it's a numbers game and it's a matter of patience. And, you know, what, what starting salary do you want? What, what do you want your opening job title to be? Do you want to skip junior developer as a role and skip right to intermediate developer? It's certainly possible if you put in the time. I mean, Hasib Qureshi. If you, I mentioned him earlier. If you look at his history, his first job was two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year as an engineer at Airbnb. If you put in the time and energy and do the legwork and keep applying, you can get amazing jobs. Uh, you know, and he turned down a job from Google. So uh, for his first job, uh, it's definitely possible. There are plenty of examples of people out there who've done these things. It's just a question of how far you want to take it. Now, at the same time, uh, focusing on learning can be a form of procrastination. And uh, it can, it, so it's a double-edged sword, right? Like you could keep sharpening the saw, but at some point you need, you know, to use the old Abraham Lincoln aphorism, if I had eight hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend the first six hours sharpening the saw or sharpening, sharpening the ax. And you could spend seven, seven and a half hours sharpening the eggs and then not have enough time to chop down the, the tree. Uh, a lot of it has to do with your runway, how, uh, you know, whether you need money. <laughs> if you need money, then just take the first thing that comes along and then figure out what you're going to do next, you know. Uh, but don't let any sort of principles uh, govern your, uh, your job search. Like, focus on your situation and what you're able to do personally. Good, good question, good answer. I, I had a question. Uh, we're largely a, a volunteer nonprofit, just like Free Code Camp. And um, I think one of the coolest things is that you created a, an attractive team culture where there, there's largely volunteers helping you. I think there's only, is there still just five staff for Free Code Camp? There and are now seven. Seven. So it's still very small, but there's thousands of volunteers. What is, um, I guess, the, the story of what comes to mind and how you kind of learned along the way that you needed to have like, a, uh, you know, we use the terms like in software development, like an agile, you know, asynchronous team. But how did that come about that you created such a successful team and what, uh, I guess, um, you know, what headaches did you encounter along the way and what, what made it what it is today? Right. Well, uh, that's a great question. The extrinsic pressures, the circumstance dictated what happened. We had no resources. Uh, we certainly didn't have like millions of dollars in VC funding to go get some office in San Francisco. I was working out of my closet uh, and, and I was eating microwave burritos and doing everything I could to possibly keep servers as low as possible. We were basically using like free tier on Heroku and then we outgrew that. And then we like eventually moved to uh, DigitalOcean because we figured out like just little incremental ways we could keep costs as low as possible. One of the things about being 
completely like when your objective is to have incredible people and also to keep costs very low, you get creative. And uh, some of the creative things we did were we just said, Hey, you know, working at free code camp, you're not going to make Silicon Valley software engineer salaries. <laughs> like I don't make a lot of money at all. I think my, my, my salary is public and it's, it's less, it's like $5,000 a month that, that I get. And uh, that's less than I was making as a school director. Right. I'm hoping that I can get a little bit more money because I just moved to Dallas. Uh, but I'm going to talk with the board about that. But, um, but I'm just saying that as an example, because um, instead of making a ton of money uh, working at free code camp, you have a ton of freedom and you get to work on stuff you care about. And everybody who works at free code camp is somebody who's contributed prolifically for years before we brought them on. Uh, Mia uh, ran the entire free code camp China community for like three years. And then we hired her full time uh, so that she could basically focus on, on growing it and also on helping us with our, our manufacturing so we can make more affordable free code camp shirts. And we recently printed the programmer playing cards. I mean, that's Mia. She went out and sourced those and got them manufactured and she's doing with the fulfillment and all that stuff. Uh, another person is, is Ahmed. Uh, he, was a long time contributor to the open source project and um, you know, for years we brought him on and he's, he's doing a full uh, UI redesign of, of like, basically if you look at the design style guide, he completely overhauled that. Um, and we're going to roll those out pretty soon. Those UI changes. And he's also contributing a lot to the DevOps and, and uh, ho helping oversee things like that. Chris uh, Koishigawa, um, he is based in Seoul. Uh, so everybody's based in different countries. Like Ahmed is in Turkey. Um, he's in Istanbul. And then um, Chris is in, in Seoul. And, or I'm sorry, he's, he's in Daegu, which is another major uh, South Korean city. And he was working as an English teacher and just contributing to our uh, interview prep section for years. And he was creating challenges and creating like these video tutorials and all that stuff. And we brought him on and now he's leading the development of version seven of the free co-camp curriculum. Bo Carnes, who I think probably everybody listening to this has probably heard of by now. Uh, he was creating these amazing YouTube tutorials, creating these great articles. And uh, we brought him on and he, he basically leads the YouTube channel and makes a lot of decisions around that. Everybody wears multiple hats. Nobody's just doing one thing. I do all the support. Uh, so like if you email team at freecocamp.org, you're going to get an email back from me. I deal with like all the, uh, all the donor relations. Uh, I deal with like, I pay all the bills and do payroll and do all that. We don't have like an office manager. Um, and then I, like, I haven't been doing nearly as much coding recently as I want to, but um, I have been doing a, a lot of writing and a lot of planning and uh, just meeting with study group leaders and all that stuff. So uh, everybody wears lots of hats. Everybody's coming with like this very long history of contributing. And basically we say, Hey, if we give you some money, can you just focus you know, on contributing full time, essentially do more of what you're already doing. And uh, because we're all in different time zones and because we're all uh, working in completely different cultures, you know, there's Ramadan, there's uh, Diwali, uh, there, there's Christmas, there, there are all these major holidays that, uh, you know, Kwanzaa, people, people are constantly having different time off. Uh, people, China has like this entire week off uh, for, uh, it's really, it's almost two weeks off for the Chinese New Year, right? So instead of trying to dictate how things get done, we're, we have a culture of trust where we just trust one another to get things done. Um, so that's basically the way Free Code Camp operates is we operate on trust and I don't, you know, have like time cards and I don't do, we don't have a lot of meetings. We have like a weekly stand-up meeting and then almost all of our other communication is done either through the forum or through, we have signal chat, which is this great uh, encrypted end to end encryption uh, chat, like messaging client that I recommend everybody use. Um, and we just communicate asynchronously that way, you know, somebody's asleep halfway around the world, unless it's an absolute emergency and a server's on fire, we don't need to like 
jump on a call at the same time often we can just schedule it like hey when you get time can can you meet me up here okay let's let's just grab a time here and let's do this and it's super casual we don't use deadlines that's another thing that shocks people why aren't there deadlines when when is version 7.0 of the free cocaine curriculum gonna yeah when it's done there's this great quote from shigeru miyamoto uh the guy who created you know mario he created zelda he created uh all these amazing uh, Nintendo games, right? He's the, the game designer who created those. He says, a rushed game will forever be bad. A delayed game will eventually be good. And that's how we approach everything. It's better to take your time and to do things right and not to be stressing out about stuff and, and not be hyping things up, not be on Twitter like, hey, you, three more days until this big thing comes out. I just watched this Fire Festival documentary on Netflix. Everybody should watch that. Because that is exactly why you don't do deadlines unless you absolutely had to. They completely did that to themselves. If they had just not focused so much on hyping the thing up and instead executing properly, it could have been a success. But uh, they had unrealistic timelines and, and they kept doubling down on mistakes. And uh, yeah, I, and I mean, the guy was a freaking con artist too, as you'll find out when you watch the documentary. But my point is... Uh, unnecessary time pressure does not motivate people you'll burn people out people don't like death marches people like a slow sustainable pace where they can do what they need to do get things done and do it right and if you talk to senior software engineers who've been working in the field for 20 or 30 years they'll almost always tell you that it's just better to slow down and do things right than introduce a ton of bugs that are ultimately just going to create a bunch more work for everybody Right. Uh, so that's like a big part of our organizational philosophy. Don't focus on the process, focus on the results and the results. Uh, if everybody's sufficiently motivated, the results will be good. Trust in the, trust in the, uh, the process of, of just communicating to one another, being candid and trust that the other people around you are working as hard as they can. And don't micromanage people. Just let people do what they think is best and, uh, you know, question their judgment. But ultimately defer to them if you think they're right. So, again, that's a very, very long-winded uh, answer. But we have a decentralized, asynchronous team because we operate on trust and because we believe in a long-term vision rather than short-term quarterly returns or whatever, right? Free Code Camp operating on a 20-year time horizon. I'm planning five years in advance. I've got things planned five years out because we know we'll be there. We've got a whole lot of donors who are making it possible for us to think long-term. We're not trying to bend over backward to appease some venture capitalist who needs to get their money out to give to their, their partners, you know, three months down the line. So yeah, those are all reasons why we're able to operate the way we are. And I think a lot of more organizations could operate like this if they wanted to. Uh, but I'm going to be writing all about like our organizational philosophy. I encourage other nonprofits, anybody who has the flexibility to take such an approach. Thanks. That's a really awesome answer. Um, I was going to ask a question for one of our participants. Um, Mesfin was asking, uh, do you believe that you've accomplished the goal of Free Code Camp? And um, is that what you've been expecting uh, and, and kind of leading into what is next for Free Code Camp? We are definitely helping people. We have tens of thousands of people who've finished Free Code Camp and gone out and gotten developer jobs. That's the goal of Free Code Camp. Free Code Camp's goal is to help as many people as possible change their careers. In a, in a positive direction, whether that's working full-time as a software engineer, or whether that's working as a technical recruiter or a marketer who knows how to code or designer who knows how to code or a manager who knows how to code, an accountant who knows how to code, a lawyer who knows how to code, just being able to take your career in a more technical direction. Now for like 90% of the people, that means going out and getting a software engineering job. Some people have created startups. Some people are working freelance. Those are all successes in my mind, because we help people who were in one field move into a field that was more prosperous. And so much of the careers in the United States and, and around the world 
are being automated or they're being outsourced. Uh, a lot of fields are just becoming relatively unnecessary just because of changes in the macro economy that are out of people's control. But everyone has an alternative. They can sit down at their convenience for no money and take however long it takes and learn to code. The resources are out there. The tools are democratized. For me, it's a huge win. Now, I think this is very early days. You know, I'm, I'm not even 40, I'm 38. This is what I'm doing. I'm going to, I'm hoping to live to 90. I'm going to see this through. I think Free Code Camp can be this great force for making it so anyone in the world, regardless of their resources, and we already have, we have kids in the slums of Delhi who are using feature phones and reading through and watching videos and learning how to code. And they're turning around and they're helping, you know, uh, their local, uh, you know, local businesses build basic websites. And they're, they're making money. You read about this kid. Uh, I think he's, he's from Lagos and uh, he, he built this uh, app that was for his, like his local community to organize events or something like that. And he was able to sell it. And he built it on a feature phone, a Nokia, like, like the, the nine button or the 12 button thing. He just typed Java code on that. Right. Um, it's a remarkable story. We published it a couple years ago and he, he got a job and he works for like an MIT startup now. And he's in the, I think he's in the U S now. Um, but people are able to do incredible things and there aren't any limits on what people can do. There are cultural norms and limits of people's imagination, but reality has no limits. It's just a question of whether people want to sit down and do the work. I mean, you look at, all the the miracles of industry of medicine all those things like so few of those things could have been imagined beforehand many of them were massive undertakings many of the biggest things that we're going to be doing as a species are going to be generational you look at like the fundamental problems facing humanity the fact that earth is so so far from any other habitable planets you know, the terraforming Mars would take generations. Like these are long-term problems and we need to take long-term approaches to them. And it's not going to be one person with some great idea. It's going to be a bunch of people who come together and come up with good ideas. And then other people who continue to carry on those traditions. That's institutions. You know, if you look at institutions like the great universities, if you look at, you know, the nation states, that have emerged. If you look at uh, the great corporations, there's a hotel in Japan that's been operating for a thousand years continuously. It's the oldest business on earth. And every generation has to make the decision. I'm not going to sell this business. I'm going to keep going. And that's what it's going to take if we want to fix a lot of these fundamental human challenges is a multi-generational sustained effort over time. And again, there are no speed limits you know, in 60 years, we could create general AI and fix everything, right? But we're still going to be stranded here on Earth. There, there are so many challenges. I look, at, I look at the world and I just see problems that need to be solved. And I'm just working with what I can right here, which is basically what I see is a bottleneck. The fact that it's a pain to learn to code and that everybody does need to learn to code and that there is so much prosperity on the other side of learning to code. And so that's going to be my life's work and my focus is just helping people get the skills they need. But, you know, my children, my grandchildren, your children, your grandchildren, it's a lot bigger than us. Yeah, that, that's true. Um, good, good answer. Um, which kind of leads me into one of the big questions I have right now personally, but I'm sure a lot of us have the same question if you're listening as well. Um, but the question is, how do you, how do you balance family and responsibilities while learning to code? And, you know, how did you do that back then? How do you do that now? Um, and you know, what, what considerations do you take in terms of like setting up personal goals for yourself and the organization short, long-term, uh, how do you, keep that together 
and still you've come out with this kind of success? Well, I'm very lucky, as I said, that I didn't have kids until I'd started Frico Camp because um, a lot of the work of Frico Camp, a lot of the uncertainty uh, has already kind of been resolved. Like the genie's out of the bottle and we've got this resource, we've got this community. Uh, we're not going to die. Uh, it's just a question of upward potential. How, how great can we become? And, and uh, so I'm extremely grateful for the thousands of people who donate each month. Uh, several of you on the call donate each month. You're making this possible. Uh, you're making uh, technology education free for everyone. Uh, you're making that possible. Uh, for me personally, having laid that foundation and at least having like a sustainable organization that has a lot of people within it that are communicating and helping one another and, and having like high level directives that we're following, like we should help as many people as possible learn to code as easily as possible. We should make the website accessible. We should make the community inclusive those kinds of overarching principles that does a lot of it. And so for me, uh, I probably work, you know, 40, 50, maybe 60 hours a week on some weeks, but I, I don't kill myself working on free code camp anymore. And that's a luxury. Uh, I think early on I was working closer to like 80 or 90 hours. Uh, there would be times that I would just sleep and I'd, I'd walk from my bed to my closet and I just sit down and work, but having gotten that basic, you know, thing going, I'm able to spend a lot more time with my kids. And so me personally, I just, I work from home. Uh, a, lot, a lot of times I'll go to the public library, but I can, it's like a short walk. So I just walk home and eat lunch with my kids. Uh, my daughter's in school. So we hang out every night. Uh, I help them uh, take a bath and get ready for bed and read them bedtime stories and stuff. It's a luxury. It is a luxury. And my dad, uh, he was, he was always gone. He was working to provide for his kids. And, uh, you know, this prosperity that I have, I absolutely do not take it for granted. So what I try to do is whenever I'm able to spend time with my kids and whenever I'm able to try to spend time with my wife, I try to spend time with them. So really for me, it's just free code camp and my family. Like I had to prioritize other things. Like I would love to, you know, spend a ton of time hanging out with my friends and just uh, playing video games, stuff like that. But I, I do that sometimes, but I, I just have to kind of keep that at a, at a minimum uh, because life's short, time is scarce, and I just want to make sure that I don't look back and regret um, not spending more time with my kids and, and with my wife and with my parents, um, you know. So, yeah, that's that's kind of like it's just a question of priorities, and then but there are always trade offs. That's just the fundamental nature of economics, the science of scarcity. How are you going to allocate this very scarce resource that is your time? And I do not fault anyone for working their asses off if they think that that's what they need to do. I would never shame somebody for not spending enough time with their kids. I think it's a personal decision. At the same time, I would never shame someone who decides to be a stay-at-home parent. I think there's, uh, there's grace in, in, uh, in everything that people choose to do. Uh, now, if somebody were to spend a whole lot of their time doing drugs or, or gambling or, or getting addicted to video games and not make an effort to try to break out of that so that they can focus on other priorities, you know, I think I would feel the ability to, to make judgment based on. But, you know, a lot of that is, you know, genetic disposition, a lot of that, like motivational issues. Not everybody is neurochemically you know, uh, I'm not sure what the correct term is, neurotypical. Um, a lot of people ha struggle with mental illness, and I'm extremely fortunate that I don't. But um, if anybody does, I would encourage them to, to make an effort to get help and not to just uh, give up because it is absolutely worth it if you can figure out a way that you can have the resources you need to provide for your family and if you can also have the time to spend with your family and if you're not looking back with regret like i could have done more meaningful work with my time on earth uh so just constantly ask yourself whether you're making the best use of your time constantly fine-tune learn from your mistakes don't fall into a defeatist trap don't let the what the hell effect 
overtake you. Um, and I think you'll be just fine. Yeah, thanks for that answer. Um, those are definitely things that I think about daily is just like, what do I want and what am I doing to get to that? Which kind of leads into something that we discussed, I think, before. But a, a big part of Free Code Camp is getting a job. And I wanted to give you the opportunity to share what you had shared earlier. Um, there was an article that you had talked about before we started recording. But um, a lot of us do have that question here is, what are the things that we should be doing to one, get a job, but two, uh, what are some things that could give us experience such as like W3 develops or other things that we're doing that could build up to us getting a job? Yeah. I mean, in my humble opinion, what I did, uh, was I freelance, just found some friends that needed stuff built. And I said, Hey, can you give me like, a thousand bucks, <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, some amount of money that's substantial enough that they're going to feel vested and they're actually going to use whatever it is you build. And you know, sales skills are invaluable here. You want to basic, like you want to read those books. Like you want to read the Carnegie books and the Ziegler, Ziegler books and just understand these fundamental aspects of interacting with other human beings. Uh, developers like gone are the days where you can just be some lone developer in a cubicle and you never have to talk to anybody. And you know, that's not how it works. I'm sorry, it's 2019. Everything is a collaborative process. You're always gonna be working with other people. It's extremely rare that a single individual has a breakthrough on their own. It does happen sometimes, but most of the important work is being done in mm. teams. So you're gonna go out, you're going to find somebody who's gonna give you some money to build it. Uh, you could volunteer. I mean, if you have a church or a mosque or a synagogue or a, you know a local um homeless shelter anything help them build their website help them build a facebook group you know it doesn't have to be working with the nuts and bolts of the web help them set up a wix page that they can ultimately maintain themselves um anything you can do to help them first of all that gives you experience interacting with people getting a sale uh, second uh gives you a portfolio piece that you can point to and uh, that is going to be a, a stepping stone to you going to be able to go out and have a portfolio that's convincing of real stuff that's in real production, not just toy projects that you built. Um, yeah, exactly. Just build yourself up one step at a time. That's my humble advice. And uh, there was the article that you mentioned. I'm failing to remember. It was interview.io or interviewer.io. Yeah, interview.io, uh, Aileen uh, Lerner, I think is her name, with an mm -hmm. L. Um, Aileen Lerner has written a lot of articles. She's done a lot of research. Some of it's pretty controversial, but uh, just about the interviewing process. Um, and, you know, it's based on sample sizes that are sig statistically significant. It's maybe like hundreds or thousands of developers on her platform that have been doing interviews. And, and we published a lot of her articles. And then... I mean, you just can't go wrong reading anything written by Hasib Qureshi. There's a guy named Patrick McKenzie who writes great articles about the nature of work. Uh, you know, and then like the classic bloggers like Joel Spolsky, uh, Coding Horror, uh, Jeff Atwood, and then just following a lot of smart people on Twitter. You know, you should definitely follow uh, Sarah Drasner. You should definitely follow. Um, Saran Itabarak, you should definitely follow um, gosh, uh, Scott Hanselman, people like that. I mean, they're kind of household names, uh, but you follow them and then you start to see who they're following and you follow those people too. And pretty soon you've got this giant support network of people that are providing really good guidance. And that's what it's all about. Like we have a very, we're a very blessed community in the sense that software development is such a burgeoning field but there's not cutthroat competition, right? If you want to go into the field of uh, sales, for example, it's much more competitive. If you want to go into the field of, um, you know, well, I can't think of very many good uh, analogies right now, but, but software engineering is a very inclusive field and it's very self-aware of the fact that it's male dominated and that it's mostly, uh, it's mostly white and Asian men that are basically in all these corporations and um, 
trying to do the right thing every turn of the way. So because of that, it's, it's really beneficial to people who want to get into the field because they're going to have incredible support and they're going to have a whole lot of people out there who want to help them. So get plugged in. Okay. Uh, Andrew, did you have a question? Are you, you're saying scratch that question. Sorry. Um, did anybody have any other questions? I, I had uh, a couple other questions that I had documented. How do you go for it? Okay. Uh, I'm going to shift gears towards uh, mentors, like the topic of a mentor. Um, who would you say was your primary mentor? What's the, the backstory of how they became your mentor? Um, and, you know, based on that experience, what, what do you feel like makes a great mentor in general? Yeah. Yeah, so my humble advice on, on mentors is like there can be really powerful mentors in your life, but you want to have a community of mentors and not just rely on a single person to lead you uh, and show you the way. Uh, you know, we have this kind of mythos of, of mentors, you know, Yoda mentoring Luke. Um, and um, I'm trying to think of some other good examples from popular fiction. But the reality is, Mostly, it's just like a big community of people that help one another. And Rocky uh, Balboa and Nick. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you can find a Yoda or, or a Mick. Or who's that karate kid? He had a. Yeah, Mr. Miyagi. Yeah, wax on, wax off. Yeah, yeah Mr. Miyagi. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, it's great if you can find that sort of mythical mentor, but you're much better off looking for a community where you can get plugged in and meetups and, and events around your town are a great way to do that. And, and then of course, online communities uh, like what you all have going here. Um, W3 develops like any kind of community where people are proactively trying to help one another is a good thing. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't wait <laughs> for a mentor to come into your life. I would go proactively and and don't bother emailing people saying, "Will you be my mentor?" Uh, that just it it doesn't work. Um, people are busy, and the reality is, like if somebody wants to be your mentor, they're going to proactively take you under their wing. That would be my humble advice. Uh, but you, good advice is everywhere, and motivation, and and inspiration, and and positive peer pressure; those are all around to be found. So just acknowledge like see it for what it is don't overlook the fact that people are trying to help you don't view people trying to help you as some sort of hostility or like oh you don't think i know how to do this you know no just just check your ego and and try to learn as much as you can from other people yeah that was a piece um uh, that you went extensively uh into detail on the free code camp podcast which if you've not listened to that i would highly suggest listening to that quincy and um I think, is it, is it Abby? Abby yeah. also yeah. does some podcasts. Abby. Yeah. She's Abby. the primary person who runs the podcast. Right. Yeah. They, they, they actually did a podcast with a, a guy named Sean Wang. Is that correct? Yeah. Sean Wang, uh, Swix. Yes. Uh, but the quote that stuck with me has been, um, you can learn anything on the internet. You just have to check your ego at the door. Um, but that's so true that if you want to learn in public, you definitely have to say like, I'm willing to take a low position and that everybody sees that I'm stupid in this one way, but uh, to not let that like totally blow you away. But I, I, I don't know if you wanted to elaborate any more on that or um, talk about that at all. Um, that That's something that, I coming from a non-technical background, I wasn't aware of that. And so coming into tech, that was really hard because as you said, kind of the university system has a way of weeding people out. And that that is kind of like the criteria of whether you have the grit to stick is whether or not you can kind of fight through that, um, that, that gatekeeper type of situation. But I don't know, I'm talking too much, but I'll hand it over to you. Let you address that. Yeah. It gets easier with time. Uh, Get used to being wrong. I mean, when you're a developer, you're basically having a 
a computer tell you your play. Every error message, every failing test, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. That's the nature of reality. Life's a struggle. The sooner you accept that life is a struggle and that, uh, y- you know, there's this dream of things being smooth and, and there's this illusion that people make where they had this clean arc. It doesn't happen for most people. Most people do struggle. And uh, as long as you know that everybody around you is struggling just as hard and the, the successful people, you know, are not overnight successes generally, generally there's a lot of hard work involved. Um, you know, just once you acknowledge that and internalize that on an intellectual level, then it becomes a lot easier because you can see your failure for what it is. It's just an opportunity to improve and adapt. Um, so yeah, I, I think that just build up that grit. Uh, anybody can do pretty much anything that most humans are like 99.99% genetically identical and also like 95% identical to a banana or something like that. But I mean, there's like very little variation in, in individual human beings. Almost all of it has to do from a process of layering on advantages over the course of your life. If you start learning to code really early on, of course you're going to have like a ton of extra experience coding. So it's expected that you'd be better at coding than somebody who just started two days ago, right? Like all this makes perfect sense if you think about it in that, uh, that regard. Like when you read every single day, when you listen to podcasts every single day and you have this very you know, voracious information diet, then of course you're going to be a better conversationalist. You're going to be more articulate. All these things are just positive side effects of working it. And so it doesn't matter if, you know, like me, you're in your thirties and you don't know jack about technology and your wife's configuring the Wi-Fi router because you're not patient enough to figure out how to do it yourself. It's never too late to just say, Hey, you know what? I'm going to make a concerted decision that I'm going to slow down and check my ego and, and learn these things. And uh, the sooner you make those decisions, whether that's about learning technology, whether that's about becoming a better listener, uh, whether that's about spending more time with your grandma, those are all things that you can do. Everything is a choice. And yes, there are circumstances that make some choices, you know, the trade-offs more uh, substantial than others. But um, if where there's a will, there's absolutely a way. Okay. Uh, I think Adam had a follow-up question yeah, to would, the mentor would, question. I would like to add something to that, but like, like, like Mr. Lesson was saying right quick though, like, you know, about checking your ego at the door and stuff like that. Like that was a big thing for me too. Like I, I, I've always came up like reading books and stuff where it's like, you know, the, the quotes of like Aristotle or all these other people, but the, you know, big, I remember quotes that said like, you know, I, I want to be the, if if I'm the smartest person in the room, I, I want to be in a different room. I'm in the wrong room. That that type of stuff, you know. Like I've never been like in university and all that stuff, but that's kind of how I was always molded myself. It's like I want to be around. And, and another another thing that like like you guys were saying is um, uh, you know, with the mentor thing, my mentors are all of you guys here right now. You know, that you know my my mentors are my friends. You know, like like you can actively seek a mentor. Or you can join a community like Free Code Camp, like W3 Brothers, like 100 Days of Code, like any of those communities, and just you, you can just meet the people there. And the people that you talk to, those can be your mentors. You guys can mentor each other, grow together, and just you know become friends at the same time. And then you're, you don't have to worry about your mentor leaving you. As long as you guys are growing together and you know there's always something to learn from each other, which there usually always is something to learn from somebody, even if they're not as smart as you. I'm not going to say not as smart, but not as well versed in the technologies that you were focusing on or anything like that, you know, there, there's always something to learn from somebody one way or another. You know, I just want to put that two cents in, like be, let your mentors be your friends, but you know, d- don't let that me saying that discourage you from going out and actually finding somebody that's, you know, at Google that's willing to teach you. But I, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> go ahead, buddy. Yeah, go ahead. You had a question, Adam? Um, yeah, uh, kind of in the same vein as the uh, the whole mentor thing. Um, I think you alluded to, obviously, that the, to, we, 
I, I have fallen for that as well. This whole like looking for Mr. Miyagi or Yoda or basically somebody who's like, do these five things and you're a developer, right? Um, and then I've noticed that uh, as, as part of networking, really just asking questions to, to everybody, um, especially developers, um, you, you kind of, they kind of just become your mentor, right? Like there, there's never like, there's, it's kind of like an unspoken thing, but you have the ability to, to go and message somebody like, hey, I'm having a problem with this. And they kind of give you feedback. So I guess, um, I guess it's a two part question. So the first one is, is would you say like, would it be easier to kind of just reach out to people and say like, hey, I know you, you know, you're not, you're, you're a very busy person, I'm sure. Kind of like, I guess, being a little more humanizing rather than like expecting something, would you say, um, would it be better to kind of like provide value to somebody who you would prefer to be like, I guess, quote unquote, a mentor? Uh, and then the second thing is, is there seems to be, um, especially kind of on Jonathan's point, like um, a mentor is not like somebody who knows everything, right? Like who knows all of web development because nobody knows all of web development as I've learned. Um, but would you say it's, it should be a balance of people who are, you know, learning with you at the same time, as well as people who are advanced or maybe people like, would it be better to have a, a, a mixture of people in varying degrees of knowledge of the thing that you want to learn as well as, um, you know, people who are, who are very, who are a lot more confident, would you say like it would be better to have uh, a balance or, you know, certain number of people or uh, what would your take be on that? Sure. So first question uh, about like how you should go about contacting prospective mentors. Uh, and the second question, uh, like what the right mix of mentors might look yeah, like. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And before I answer those questions, I just, I, I feel embarrassed, but about the reality is I, I misspoke earlier uh, about the genetic thing i'm not like a life science guy I just was quoting funny anecdotes but we're actually only 60 percent related to a banana not 95 percent. so i i did have to look that up just to make sure i wasn't putting my foot in my mouth and i guess it was um so how should you reach out to people who are going to be your mentor again my humble advice is that uh, i mean i say this as somebody who gets a lot of mentor requests and i'm sure like a lot of people get these i heard a great talk uh by oh, what is her name uh at at codeland uh saran itabarak's um uh big conference the code newbie conference her name will occur to me as soon as i get off this call i guarantee it but she had this great talk about like asking questions and like you know how to ask somebody to be your mentor. Basically, you wanna keep the ask as absolutely small as possible. And really, you just wanna ask like a single question. Like the ultimate way, if you wanna be mindful of people's time is to ask yes, no questions. Um, or, or ask very specific questions like, here's my project, what do you think? You know, here's my project. Can you think of any ways that I could improve the usability of this? You know, or here's my project, it's, or here's the JavaScript that powers this, you know, this uh, API that I've, I've written. Like, could this be more succinct? Those are the kinds of things that you should be asking. Um, if you keep the ask small, and if you're respectful of their time, they'll be much more likely to respond in the first place, and to potentially answer follow-up questions. Like, I have really long discussions with people that could be like, you know, 30, 40 emails back and forth because they're asking very quick, short questions that I can tell they do care about my time and they are thinking about me. They're not just selfishly saying like, oh, uh, tell me how I can be great, Quincy. Something like that, right? So um, that is a good way to do it. But, you know, it's probably kind of like a, a, a winner take all type scenario in the sense that the most prominent people in the developer field get like a disproportionate share of the mentor requests, there's a very good chance that just some person uh, who you saw at a local meetup uh, maybe just as qualified to be 
your mentor and to help you learn CSS as like a Sarah Drasner, um, for example, or s some other, you know, kind of like internet famous uh, developer celebrity. You should approach those people and just say like, hey, if I, if I buy you some coffee, would you be willing to sit down and pair program with me on Saturday or something like that? Mm -hmm. Like keep yeah. the ass small and Definitely. just gradually kind of like, shoehorn your way in and then um from there you can let the relationship kind of blossom organically but yeah. coming out to say like will you be my mentor is is almost kind of like a big turnoff mm -hmm. in the same way that like will you marry me on a first date is is a big turnoff right or like if if nothing else like a uh yeah so that that's why i recommend you take a very incremental approach and, and just be respectful of people's time and acknowledge that you don't need some rock star to teach you javascript pretty much anybody who's been coding javascript for a few years could probably be an excellent javascript teacher if you know how to ask them the right questions yeah that makes me think of like a brene brown reference where she talks about building trust with people and you know she's talking about that in the sense of like you're making yourself vulnerable with somebody so, you know, just like put one marble in the, in the, the jar at a time, you know? So with getting a mentor, I think of it in that sense of like, you're, you know, you're giving them a marble, one marble at a time. And then if they respond and accept the marble, then you just continue to build the relationship in terms of like nuggets of information that you're sharing about your life and nuggets of information that you're asking from them. But uh, the final question I had was <clears throat> related to um, just the ability that you have to be so present in the social media sphere and the ability to answer questions like you spent an extensive amount of time with us here today, which we're hugely grateful for your time. But um, I think that was the first question I had was just like, uh, that your inbox must be totally insane and how on earth do you respond to so many questions, tweets, emails, etc.? How do you get, get everything done? It's important. I prioritize it. Um, as I said earlier, I've been coding a lot less. Uh, I've been doing a lot less like design work, been doing a lot less writing um, because, I mean, those things are important, but I really just want to be there for the community and facilitate other people doing the coding, doing the writing, um, doing the design work. I, at this point, I almost kind of feel like I've, I've fallen back a little bit and am coaching in a way. And, and, and I've always been a facilitator, you know, I've been a school director and I lead through other people. Um, whether that was, you know, an admin staff an academic director, and you know a student student advisor staff and then the instructors and, and instructional designers all that in my traditional career as a school director but now uh you know I, I see myself more as like a flex slot in that i do the things that nobody else in the organization would necessarily be uh it wouldn't be worth their time to 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 be spooled up to do that like uh i just already know how to do it i can just do it real quick and i don't have to waste somebody's time or I guess expend somebody's time onboarding them on how to do this specific task. Um, so for me, like a huge part of what I do now, I've delegated a lot of the stuff that I was originally doing early on in free code games days. And that gives me a little bit more time and energy to focus on helping people uh, as they, as they write in, I get, you know, my inbox is kind of crazy. I get several hundred emails a day, but um, I'm very efficient about responding. And uh, a lot of times if you've gotten a response from me, it may look exactly the same as a response that uh, somebody else has gotten to a similar question because I've got like a clipboard tool and often uh, it's like pattern recognition. Okay, I'm reading their email. I see, okay, they seem to be in this circumstance. They seem to have this sort of question. Here's my best advice. So I'm not like off the cuff trying to give them like, a great answer instead I've prepared something that I think will be maximally helpful for them. And then, you know, they'll follow up and then after they've followed up and give me more context, then I can go in and personally kind of like give them more nuanced answers. 
Um, so uh, there's kind of a quick, fast first pass and then uh, detailed follow up. And same thing with social media and things like that. Uh, I basically just have like this loop that I operate under where I go through, you know, all my email, my GitHub notifications, uh, Twitter messages, all that stuff. Um, and then I, I just start on the other side and I try to get, you know, do inbox zero. Uh, but again, I wouldn't be able to do all this stuff first if I didn't have an amazing team of people who are helping uh, run free code camp to whom I can delegate things. Uh, and I wouldn't be able to do this if I didn't think it was a super high priority and wasn't willing to make other sacrifices to do it. Ultimately, uh, you can do anything if you prioritize, uh, but you can't do everything. Did anybody else have any quick questions before we kind of wind things down? Yeah. Uh, so, actually, Elliot's got an interview to go to soon. And thank you guys all for being here. Um, we appreciate every single last one of you guys that came. And, you know, just, I've never had a podcast like this. I did do a podcast before where I had people on, and it just wasn't really my thing. This right here was beautiful, though. I love having everybody from the Free Code Camp community here, everybody from the W3 Developers community. And it, uh, Mr. Larson, thank you so much for spending time with me. I have a quick question, though. Just a personal question right quick. Um, MongoDB, should I learn a NoSQL? Should I learn a NoSQL database like MongoDB before I learn no, uh, like, like a, a SQL database like MySQL? What would, would a, if I'm going for like the Merge stack and stuff like that? I mean, in 2019, it doesn't really matter because you're going to be doing most of your database work through uh, uh, an ORM, an object relational mapper. Uh, so, for example, with, with MongoDB, the most common one is Mongoose. And then we use uh, something called Loopback, which is kind of like Express and Mongoose rolled into one. It's, it, it's difficult to explain what, uh, what Loopback is, but it's, it's pretty cool. Um, you can go in and learn like the low level SQL statements too. And we're going to cover that in our new curriculum uh, or like version seven of our curriculum. I don't say new because it's the same certifications, the same final projects. You don't need to stop, like just keep going through the curriculum and you'll notice things are like new modules are popping in that are totally optional that are better than the old stuff. But um, SQL, we are going to teach SQL and I do think it's worth learning SQL for sure because just learning SQL teaches you how relational databases work. The best resources for learning SQL, frankly, there aren't that many great ones, but we have a really long video. We have two videos. We've got, if you just go on YouTube and you type SQL, you'll see, I think the top result will be our SQL video that's like maybe four or five hours long. And then there's also a database design video that's like nine hours long uh, that uh, Caleb Curry did. And just do those videos. And then there's a website called SQL Zoo, SQL Zoo dot net or dot info or something like that that's a good place uh but you know you don't need to to learn it um you can learn it if you want to my humble advice is just learn the stuff that you need the very bare minimum that you need to be able to get a job because once you're working full-time as a developer that's when the real learning starts and you're getting paid to learn very and, much so <laughs> yeah. you're working with a team and you've got people around you who you can who can help you and you're working on a practical problem not some abstract like i think this you know represents what real work would be like i mean contributing to open source is very similar to working on a you know a real life remote team so that's, that's a good proxy but but yeah just get a job as quickly as possible it's my humble advice and then work on backfilling theory and things like that Well, I wanted to unmute everybody just for a second and just give you a big thank you and round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Quincy. It's very appreciative. Thank you, Quincy. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck with your job interview, Elliot. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I'm uh, really hoping for good things, but um, we'll we'll see. I mean, I'm I'm just in the beginning.
but uh, I wanted to uh, just unmute you again. Sorry. I just muted everybody for a minute. But um, let me unmute you, John. I'm on Sorry. Mute. Okay, you're unmuted. Okay. Um, Mr. Larson, let me let me ask you this. Uh, these are all your students here, okay? Like, is there like, I don't know, is there like anything like that you would want to like ask to us? Because like we've been talking, we've we've kind of been like yapping your ear off, just talking to you and just getting, just get, just just picking your mind this whole time, man. <laughs> and for like, yeah. What what can we be doing for Free Code Camp in terms of open source projects and improving Free Code Camp Seven? Yeah, if you go to contributing.freecodecamp.org, there are like five simple things you can do. Uh, one of them is to contribute to the Free Code Camp Guide, which is a really helpful reference. Uh, it's basically good enough answers on very common computer science and programming concepts. Um, and if you know a lot, if you took a lot of math classes in college, or if you happen to know a whole lot about Scala or something like that, go and beef up those articles. Um, if you happen to know another world language and you want to help contribute subtitles to the YouTube videos, that is a huge help uh, because, you know, Free Code Camp, like only 33% of people who use Free Code Camp are in, the, in North America. You know, uh, Nigeria is one of the biggest countries. India, uh, India is number two. Nigeria is number three. China, I think, is like number four, number five, and then in Russia, a lot of big countries, Brazil, where people aren't necessarily native English speakers. Um, of course, in, in India and in Nigeria, people are. But like, it does help to have, um, yeah, perfect, and I see you brought it up. And the other thing, of course, hang out on the forum and just give people, help people when they ask questions and give them feedback on their projects. Like, the forum is probably the most, uh, bang for your time in terms of just helping a, a huge number of people because not only are you answering a question that somebody has uh, you know 95 98% of the traffic to the forum is people who aren't even logged in who are just arriving there from Google because they're trying to get help get unstuck with like a JavaScript question so just get active on the forum and help people in your community learn to code encourage people around you that they can learn to code, that it's not some arcane thing that like, oh, I suck at math, so I must, or I'm already 30, I can't learn to code. <laughs> you know, like people have all these things, these defeatist things that they say. Not at all. And yeah, I mean, none of it's true. I know none people in their true. 70s who are learning to code. Uh, I know people who are, uh, you know, have severe uh, cognitive disabilities that are still learning to code. Yeah, because people in prison. Yeah, people in prison, free code camps being used in a number of prisons around the United States to help people. Uh, so when they get out, they'll be able to have a, a useful job skill so they can reintegrate in society and provide for their families. So, you know, just, just by encouraging people and rolling back the myth, the Hollywood myth of the young genius uh, male hacker uh, who, you know, is outsmarting all the adults and all that stuff just just by kind of beating back those kind of myths and showing like no everybody should code you watch star trek every single character on star trek knows how to code. they all know how to write algorithms you know the the way they interact with the computer is usually by telling the computer what to do but that's it's programming it's the future people need to know how to use technology just like they needed to learn how to read they needed to learn how to drive a car they needed to learn how to use microsoft word microsoft excel Coding is just the next thing that people need to learn and uh, it'll open so many doorways for them. So just be encouraging and a supportive person and mentor people. Yeah, I'm just taking a dive in the, uh, in the forum right quick, showing everybody like this right here. And uh, the fact that like uh, when I go on to the, uh, I, uh, it, that, that, on the challenges that ask for help, that ask for help, that part is so helpful. Just seeing, even if somebody asks like the same question, like, and I love how, uh, I'm not sure who this is right here, but like somebody has this emblem right here and it is so helpful. And uh, whoever that yeah. is. Ariel Leslie, she was on the Free Code Camp podcast a few days ago, or I think two weeks ago. Go and listen to her interview. She's super inspiring. Oh, she, she's oh a that's Ariel? Oh, yeah. I love that. 
Yeah. She was the one that's like, I'm gonna get you, <laughs> you little <laughs> like she was like excited when she got the got the answer, I think. I, I don't know, that's all I remember about her was just that yeah, I think her her so. attitude of like, you know, I'm gonna get the bug, you know, she's like a verbal verbal programmer, I think. Yeah, we've got so many super contributors like Ariel in the community. Uh, it's podcast.freecocamp.org. I need to set up a redirect. Um, but um, if you just go through there and find people uh, who are doing incredible things and try to be like them, you know, Free Co Camp, if nothing else, is a way for the world to discover people who can be extremely inspiring and extremely helpful. We're just trying to make it easier for people to step forward and help one another. Um, so you can be the next super contributor and you could be the next and, and people launch careers at our free code camp. They launch their own coding boot camps. They create their own courses. They become, uh, you know, professional coding tutors or, or they just get really good jobs at like Apple or Google, you know, uh, teaching is one of the best ways to solidify your own understanding of a topic and to also engender goodwill from other people who are likely to reciprocate later when you're looking for a job or something, right? You, you do favors for other people and you know, it's karma. Good things come back to you. So, yeah. Thank you everybody for your time. Uh, and I am so thrilled that you all are helping mentor one another, helping one another, uh, advance your careers. And, uh, it's just super inspiring what you all are doing with W3 develops. Thank you. Thank you so much for everything you've done again. You just, you know, just keep on keeping on. We're going to help out any way you can, we can. Uh, you know, we're, we're, like we said, we're, we're here for you. We're your community, man. So we just appreciate everything that you've done for us. And we're just going to keep on keeping on, man. And so, you know, and so just, just until, man, just not until anything. Until, until, man. <laughs> so thank you again, man. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a beautiful day. All right. And we'll let Thank you so close it out with uh, the way that you always close out the free free code camp podcast. Happy coding, everyone. <laughs> Later. <laughs>